Hi everybody and welcome to the Writing Lounge. Today we are working on what I like to call quote burgers and it's a technique to help you integrate sources really easily and really expertly. So we're going to see what that entails. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm Allison Freyberg, and I am a professor of communication and cultural studies in the School of Business and Society at the University of Redlands. You can read about what I teach right here, leadership communication. Uh, much of the time I am taking students on st short-term study abroad programs to visit businesses all over the world. Uh, and if you are interested in finding out more about me, you can just click on here. By the way, if you want these slides, just send me an email. You can email me right here or find me on LinkedIn. Very easy to find. And ask me for the slides and I'll send them on over to you. Okay. Uh, if you want to find out more about the Writing Lounge, uh, including recordings of past webinars, just go on over to redlands.edu slash writing lounge. And if you want to find more out about our international programs, there's a link right there on the slides. These are all live links but uh, you can uh, always email me as well to find out. Okay, quote burgers, using sources in general. These are the kinds of comments I hear most often when we have to use sources and we're integrating them into our papers. I hear people say, if I load my document with sources, I'm going to prove my point and my paper will be longer. We all want our papers to be longer, right? Uh, the other things, here's some other things I hear. Long quotes and data tables will make my paper longer and more convincing. Or this one, hey, they said it better than I ever could, so I'm just going to quote them. And the fourth one I hear is, the quote says everything I need, it proves my point. Well, all of these tendencies will get you into trouble when integrating sources because they let the source take over your paper and you have to be the host of your paper. So here are the trouble areas that I tend to see in student writing and actually in, in more than student writing. Uh, we tend to use research simply to back up our point. So here's what we think. We're going to find someone who wrote something that agrees with it. We're going to shove it in our paper and somehow that's going to make our argument and it doesn't. Okay, or how about quoting so much that your sources take over your paper? That's what we were just talking about. And the third area where we run into trouble is not properly identifying our sources and whether it's your idea or somebody else's and that can lead to plagiarism and confusion and all that kind of stuff. So the technique I introduce you to today avoids all these trouble areas. But first, I want to talk just for a few minutes about why we get into these trouble spots. Because if, if we don't know why we get there, then it's hard to find our way out of those spots. And this is what I hear. I'm right here. Um, why using research to back up your point is a limited way of thinking. So, hey, here's what I think. Here's the research that proves it and agrees with me. Therefore, I'm right. I'm right because my source agrees I proved my point. No, you didn't your source just proved your point. You made yourself useless by simply using a source to reiterate what you already believe. What have you added to the analysis? When you talk, I always worry when I hear students talking about sources you being used to simply back up a point, okay? Because there's nothing there's nothing conversational about that. There's nothing that you as an analyst are adding to the conversation. It just ends up being all about the source and not about you. What about all the excessive quoting? Hey, I'll just quote everything. Long quotes, they make my paper longer. That's great. Hey, they said it, said it better than I ever could. Blah, 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 blah. And big, long quote. And you formatted it right and you think everything's great. Well, no. Because then you may as well think, why am I bothering to write anything? Why not just 
to get a PDF of that source, that article, and send it on over to your reader. Because if all you're doing is dumping a lot of long block quotes in there, you're basically being a publicist for somebody else's work. What do you have to say about what your source wrote? What does it mean? How is it useful for you? These are things that have to become important. And I think we all know why not properly identifying your sources leads to trouble. But in a real world sense of it, think about it this way. You're at work and your supervisor says, you know, you present something, but you don't say it's somebody else's idea. Well, then whoever you present it to is going to think it's your idea and then you become responsible for it. And then you get put in charge of projects that you're not ready to get put in charge of and really awkward things happen there. Please remember, if you don't say whose idea it is, you are saying it's yours. And if it's not, then that's a problem in many ways. Okay, so what does a poor use of a source look like? I have a few examples for you. Here's sample one. I call the big block Godzilla quote. This is that one where you take a quote and you just, boom, you just dump it in your paper and you move on. It's like a big bowling ball is just falling in your paper, right? So here's what it might look like. According to Marquez, words, 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 more words, 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 words. And then the next part that's you is just says, Marquez shows how point X is true. We've all done that. We think the quote somehow does all the work for us and it doesn't. It sits in there like a bowling ball doing nothing. Okay, in this case, the writer is invisible. The source isn't contextualized and it takes over the voice of the paper. Okay, I have no idea who Marquez is. I have no idea the context of this quote. It's just tossed in there. Now, it's not always quotes we're talking about, right? Sometimes we'll toss big tables or charts, especially important charts, into our papers because they uh, do a lot of work, right? And they also take up half a page, so that's good. The same problem with dumping a big quote in there. How are you helping us to read the chart? As a writer, as an analyst, it's your responsibility to help us through this piece of yours. Again, the writer's invisible, the source isn't contextualized. This chart just takes over. I don't know where the chart comes from. I don't know what it's trying to say. I don't know what you want me to see. It's just sitting there like a big bowling ball. Now these ones are a little more subtle, but they still bring out a lot of problems. Here's sample three, not contextualizing the source. So according to Marquez, how many of you have paragraphs that start with according to so-and-so and then a quote? And then words, 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 words. And she continues by saying words, words, words. And then as a writer, I wrote all these. As a writer, I'm trying to explain what this quote means and what it's doing for me, right? So by this, Marquez means blah, 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 whatever Marquez means. And if we apply Marquez's concept of blah, blah, blah to whatever my topic is, then I start talking about my ideas and that's great. Okay, so this second part, that's pretty good. The problem is this first part. Who's Marquez? What's Marquez writing about? What is Marquez's argument? What's the quote going to be about? Where does this information come from? This is all the stuff that we need to know so that we know that Marquez in this play, in this instance is a useful source. It's relevant. Okay, so we see that a lot. If you notice, for example, a bunch of your paragraphs starting with according to so-and-so, blah, 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 we have no idea who so-and-so is, and we don't know why we should believe them. Now, yeah. this is the opposite problem, not explaining the quote or the purpose it serves in your project. 
So watch, in this case, we I actually do introduce who Marquez is and what her area of expertise is. So look at this first part. Crisis leadership is at the forefront of management studies currently. Director of the Center for Innovation Leadership, Chela Marquez, writes extensively about leading in times of crisis and argues that flexibility is key. Okay, this is who Marquez is, this is what she writes about, and this is her point. Now I'm ready to introduce a quote. She explains, quote, 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 quote. But the problem now is what comes after the quote. I'm just moving on to another example, as if the quote proves everything. The quote proves nothing. I know who Marquez is, I know what Marquez's expertise is, I know what the argument is, and I know what the quote is, but I don't know what the quote is doing for the writer's paper. I've only done half the job here. So, how are we supposed to bring research sources into our writing projects? I do want to recommend Writing Analytically. It's um, a book by Rosenwasser and Stephen, and I have never seen a book about analytical writing that's stronger than this one. I really, really like it. And they talk about using sources conversationally as a point of departure. Now, they get quite specific about their six reasons, but I'm going to show you quote burgers as an application of it. So they say, make your sources speak, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Attend carefully to the language of your sources. Get them right. Supply ongoing analysis of your sources. Don't just wait till the end, because that's if you just if you wait till the end, then you end up with a bunch of quotes and you end up with a whole stack of quotes, like like you're at the IHOP of quotes and you just big stack of quotes. Use your sources to ask questions, not just provide answers. Use your sources to open up a conversation, not close it down. It's very different. Put your sources into conversation with one another. It doesn't always have to be about, um, you know, quote, two sides of a story or both sides of a story. There's a million sides to all stories, right? If you have, let your sources converse with one another. Let their arguments play out amongst each other. You'll have a much more nuanced and comprehensive analysis. And very importantly, you have to find your own role in that conversation. It's not just enough to fetch a bunch of sources and dump them in your paper and think that that's somehow a research paper. You're not a researcher then. You're not an analyst. You're not contributing. So, how do you do all these six things when you want to bring in a source? I think you use the burger method. And this is where you introduce the source, the subject, and the point you're going to focus on. You integrate the quote, the idea, the table, the data, whatever comes from somebody else. You explain what that means. And then you clarify your purpose for using it. Introduce, integrate, explain, and clarify. Okay. Don't let the quotes and the tables and the graphs and the charts do all the work for you because they don't. You need to think of introduce, integrate, explain, and clarify as layers. Right? And building these layers, and here we go, is kind of like building a burger. Or as I like to say, if you like what you source, build a burger for it. Okay, so here's this silly idea that I hope actually clarifies some this technique for you. So here's a burger. This is actually a lentil burger, um, but you can have the burger of your choice. And the lentil burger recipe is available upon request. But let's look at these layers, right? Whoops. 
We have buns and pickles and tomatoes and onions and the patty and the lettuce and the bottom bun, right? We all have different ways of building our layers, but we all build a burger of some sort, whether it's a lentil burger or some other form of burger, bean burger, turkey burger, whatever burgers you're having, right? The first thing you introduce is the topic that's being addressed. Kind of where's your paper? What are we going to be talking about in this paragraph? Then you need to introduce the source. In that case, like who is Marquez? Right? What's the expertise of the source? Then you're going to introduce what whatever your whatever idea you're bringing in, the quote table chart is going to be about. You got to set us up to read it. Then you have to integrate the quotation or the data. Then you need to explain what the quotation or data means. You can't let your reader do that. You have to guide them through it. And then you explain your interest in it, what it's doing for your argument. And when you have those six layers, you have a source burger, right? If you don't have these layers and all you tend to do is dump a big quote or a big table in your paper, that would be the patty here, that would be like having a barbecue. And when your guests come over, you take something that's hot and sizzling on the barbecue, like a patty of some sort, and you just, instead of building the layers and putting it in a bun and putting it on a plate and giving it to them, you would just take the spatula, scoop up whatever the hot patty is, and essentially just fling it at them. Hits them in the forehead. That's, that's not the way to treat a guest, right? That's not the way you treat a reader either. You don't dump tables and quotes into papers. That's like flinging hot meat at your barbecue guest. Not a good idea. Okay. Silly analogy? Absolutely. Applicable? Absolutely. Let's have a look. So here's a quotation from an article by Robert Reich. It's called The Art of Narrative and it was in a journal called Leadership Excellence. And he said, and this is the quote that's really intriguing me. He said, to win the heart and soul of their employees and stakeholders, leaders need to speak to the basic stories and themes that have defined and animated their constituents for decades, if not centuries. I love that quote. I want to bring it into my paper, but I can't just grab it and dump it. I'm not going to fling food at my guests. So my task, that first layer, step one, introduce the topic being addressed. That means explain what the issue is. And this is what it might look like. I'm going to have a final version at the end. So just, just sort of go with the steps here. So I might start my paragraph by saying motivating employees and others connected to organizations has long been an issue for leaders. That's what we're going to be talking about, folks. Step two, here, that second layer, the task is to introduce the source and their topic. Who's the source? What's their expertise? What subject does the article or book focus on? You know, really introduce the source. So that might look like this. Former Secretary of Labor, Robert Reich, introduces the importance of narrative for leaders trying to influence their audiences. Okay. That's who Reich is. He is a former labor secretary, and so he understands organizational environments and organizational leadership, and so he's going to talk about narrative for leaders. Okay, that all makes sense. Good. Step three. Now you want to guide people towards the quote. Not the quote yet, but you're guiding them towards it. 
what point within the book or the article will the quote be about, you know, help, help people so that when the quote comes, we understand it. Specifically, Reich focuses on the power held within key stories with which most of us are familiar. Okay, now I'm ready. Give me the quote. Give me the quote. Here's step four. You need to integrate the quote, not just dump it in. And I'm going to give you eight techniques to actually do this step a little later on. Use a signal phrase and integrate the quotation accurately. So here's what I did here. To win the heart and soul of their employees and stakeholders, Reich contends, that's the signal phrase, leaders need to speak to the basic stories and themes that have defined and animated their constituents for decades, if not centuries. Great. Are we done? No. Five, layers five and six. In layer five, step five, you need to explain the quotation. And I know you're thinking right now, who wouldn't understand the quotation? You need to explain the quotation. It's not going to be redundant in the end, I promise you. You have to summarize what the quotation means. People should be able to read your work, skip the quotes, because people skip them anyway, and still understand your argument. That's why step five is so important. It might look like this. In other words, he recognizes that there are stories that have been handed down through centuries within cultures and speaking to those stories can help organizational leaders be persuasive and convincing. Okay, I've explained the quote. My last step is to explain what that quote is doing for me in my own analysis. Right, because the quotes and other people's ideas don't end your conversation. They allow you to continue your conversation. Why are you using this quote? Well, here's something I wrote that might explain that. This historical perspective of Reich's becomes relevant when the subject of technology leadership arises. We tend to think of Bill Gates and Steve Jobs as influential leaders based on the innovations they've brought to their fields. But perhaps part of their success lies within their use of the kinds of uh, common historical stories within their communications. So I've explained how I'm using the Reich article. Now, what does that look like? I know this is a pretty messy slide, but you get the idea here. What I did was I color coded all the steps as I built my paragraph. So you can see all six steps have a color coding. Now you'll notice yellow is the color for the actual quote, but look how I've built the layers before the quote and built them after the quote. And that wasn't that hard to do. All we did was answer the prompt questions. And this is what it would look like in a paper. And I'll tell you right now, if you notice that most of your, many of your paragraphs, not most, but many of your paragraphs when you're using sources start with quotations or according to so-and-so, you haven't explained who these people are. You haven't explained where your sources are coming from and why they're experts in the field and why they belong in your paper. If on the other hand, you notice that your paragraphs tend to end with quotes, that's usually a sign that you're trying to use a quote simply to back up your point and you're not explaining the quote, you're not explaining what it means, and you're not explaining how it's functioning within your analysis. You're missing steps five and six. Okay, so think about those six steps whenever you're bringing a quote in and look what's happened here. I had this one little quote but look how big my paragraph is. For those of you who are listening and thinking, come on, I like, to, I like to dump tables and quotes in my paper because it takes up space. It takes up a lot of words. It takes up a lot of space to actually build a proper quote burger or data burger. Now, if this were a table or data, you would just 
you know, that's also step four, but you still have to do the steps one, two, and three, and steps five and six to help us understand that data or that table or that chart. Right? Layers. It's all about the layers. Now, as promised, I said I would help you give you eight ways to integrate a quotation or how to do step four. All right, that's this one right here in red. And this is a, a very dull exercise, but it's kind of like doing scales on a musical instrument. It's just stuff you got to practice, right? So here's another quote and uh, it's also from the Reich text, and it's in today's world, leaders need to place their messages into the stories that their constituents have always heard, and that makes sense of the world they know. Great quote. But how do I actually do step four and integrate that quote? You can integrate the quote at the end of your sentence. So in this case, I would start out with something like Reich suggests that quote, 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 quote and it's integrated. You can integrate it at the beginning of your sentence. So quote, 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 suggests Reich. By the way, if you need uh, feedback and ideas or guidance on uh, doing in-text quotations according to APA style, you can go over to the Writing Lounge website and uh, there is a recording of that and you can always just send me an email or find me and ask me to send you the learning guide for that the packet you can integrate a quotation in the middle of your sentence so you might start rice suggests that quote 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 because blah 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 that works also it's really great you know what great exercise is to take one quote like i've done here and do it eight different ways okay you can do it divided by your own words. That's what I did in our sample, right? I put, uh, in today's world, Reich suggests, blah, 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 blah. So I split the quote up. And you'll notice that every way you integrate it, something else gets emphasized. Now you can do it with a colon. Reich explains succinctly what needs to be done, colon, and then you can have the quote. How about with a comma? In this case, this is the old according to the author, comma, and then the quote. You can integrate with that. Reich argues that. You'll notice there's no comma here because there would never be a comma grammatically there as well. If you're interested in uh, some uh, punctuation and grammatical matters, we're going to be doing a grammar time writing lounge in a couple of weeks. Uh, leaders need to, so Reich argues that blah, blah, blah. And you can integrate the quotation by using as says or as suggests. So as Reich suggests, comma, because again, the comma is necessary there grammatically. It has nothing to do with the actual quote. This is just an introductory phrase. No matter what came after, you would always have a comma there. So those are eight different ways to do step four. Here's a quick recap for you. Don't use sources uncritically simply to back up what you say. Don't quote excessively. And in fact, in the social sciences, quoting is much less common than paraphrasing, okay? But when you are bringing in people's ideas, you need to bring them in either through paraphrase or quoting. And in each case, try to build a burger for that. Don't neglect to clarify whose ideas are whose, right? Be clear if it's not your idea. That way you create the space to contribute to your analysis. Ironically, by clarifying when it's someone else's idea, you create the space for your idea to be included. So, do use sources conversationally, as we talked about that. And by conversationally, we mean that they'll keep talking and you'll keep talking. Try the burger method for quotes, data, tables, any kind of source that you're bringing in. And remember that if you are bringing in a quotation, integrate them. Don't just plop them in there. That's those eight steps to integrate. 
All right, so that takes us through using sources and a quote burger's recap. Upcoming in the writing lounge, we have presentations that deliver, and as I mentioned, grammar time. You can always join us right here, and you can always find what's coming up in the writing lounge. Thanks for joining. Happy quote burgers.